Ready, guys? All right, so uh, uh, first part, we're going to finish up our uh, exotic rotation. We've done ruminants, we've done equine, and now we're going to do rodents and... Before we get into that, I was kind of going over some stuff and I didn't have an answer, so I looked into it over the week. Um, at the last WSAVA conference here, and this is a couple years ago, uh, a series of Korean researchers actually looked into the problem. I had asked the question, all right, so what if we were stuck in an emergency situation? I gave an alpha to like? Seven. Perfect, but give me another one. Quickly, Drex, I know, N not teal is all. Um, Excellent. What would be universal for Dex metatomidy? Quickly, 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 don't think, just say it. Nope. Adipamazole. What if you didn't have adipamazole and what if you had yohimbine? I ask myself these questions and they keep me up and I look into it. So these guys actually figured out that it's to give uh, yohimbine instead of adipamazole as a reversal. So if you're stuck in the wild and somebody had hit you with an alpha-2, you can go ahead and reach for yohimbine. I looked into the cellular mechanics with some of my old textbooks. Um, the reason why we have adipamazole for dexmedetomidine or metatomidine, they have a binding strength on the order of 20,000 times versus yohimbine. So when you want to displace those little chemicals off their receptors from the dexmedetomidine, you're, you're going to get the best bang for your buck with adipamazole or antecedent. You use yohimbine, it only has eight times the affinity. So that's the reason. Basically, you get a much more reliable, much more rapid, much more safe reversal when you do the alpha-2 specific for the alpha-2. But if you're stuck in a pinch, go ahead. It's effective, effectively reversed. So I thought that was pretty cool. This is pretty much it. These guys are tiny. These guys scream. These guys are hyper have heart rates in the hundreds. In fact, we'll have to get um, ECG machines that high end 400 beats per minute. That's how fast these guys go. When my buddies do rabbit anesthesia, only as I'm walking in, and they're walking out, of course, I can hear the beep, 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 freaks me out to hear it. And he's like, yeah, that's normal. And so that's, to me, just a consistent VTAC arrhythmia. For the most part, this is what we do with our little guys. Um, endotracheal intubation, very, very difficult. I'll show you a technique for nasal tracheal intubation. Nothing we'll ever do in this class, but um, these are pretty hard to kind of get down here. Blood work is darn near impossible in anything outside of rabbits. Um, Wendy, why would blood work be difficult in, let's say, your gerbil, your hamster, your rat? You got it. Our, our machines are very, very sensitive, but they do require a certain amount of blood. The blood volume you'd have to take for a proper analysis would be almost 80% of their blood volume, 90% of their blood volume. You exsanguinate your patient. Exsanguinate means you bleed them dry. So it's not uh, uh, something that we do. So we actually fly very, very blind with a lot of our uh, exotic anesthesia here. Um, these guys are also very, very, very uh, metabolic. They age very rapidly. An 18-month-old rat is a geriatric. So these guys um, age very, very quickly. And so the life expectancy is shortened. Animals, owners, owners only have them for a short bit of time. When they come into a clinic, it's for an emergency thing. And by the time you see them for an emergency thing, they're already geriatric. So it really really confounds what you do in terms of your work up here. Um, think about transporting these guys to a clinic, terrible. I have never, ever, ever seen an exotic only veterinarian. And so can you imagine, you are a gerbil, you're getting transported into a room full of predators. You smell them everywhere. What does that do to your catecholamines? Jacks them up. Your epinephrine response is through the roof here. You are stressed, heightened. You're in fear mode constantly. Now this guy with the white coat is reaching in. It's just a dangerous situation for everybody. They don't like those scenarios. And I think a lot of my colleagues do a poor job when it comes to housing these patients in a veterinary clinic setting. They, they don't keep that in mind. I try to even keep my cats and dogs in separate parts of our hospital. I try to work in clinics with a feline only area. Makes for a smoother everything here. Imagine if you've got mice, birds, etc. Not a cool scene for these guys here. Um, <clears throat> their respiratory pattern, terrible. Uh, everything about them is skittish. Uh, they're very irregular. There's, there's nothing natural about this setting here. Do it. Okay, cool, so we told you about this here. Um, okay, uh, we talked about here, there too. Uh, when you work with these guys, try to have, if you're doing exotics, an exotics only area, an exotics only uh, uh, attire, an exotics only setup here, an exotics only room, etc. cetera. Uh, at VCA Nationwide, we're kind of doing this cat champion thing now too. We're trying to reserve certain areas of our hospital for felines. We're trying to de designate a certain area of our uh, lobbies for felines only, carriers only for feline use, and actually employees who only manipulate felines. And special rooms where in our little plugs, we have special feline pheromones. So we're trying to improve the quality of our feline approach. And this is sort of uh, permeating and percolating through into other areas of vet medicine too. So, all right, so how do you hold a mouse? Okay, uh, so with the mouse, I've seen it, I'll never do it. They're, they're facing that way and you kind of just grab them by their tail and they swing all over the place and you drop them on your forearm. 
or they have these special cones and you stick them into the cone and the cone gets smaller and smaller and their little noses stick out of the cone and you can play with their back in there and some guys you can scruff them and I would never do that but, but you could you could touch them uh, and so <laughs> this is essentially what it looks like here uh, we'll go over the uh, ejection sites rats are a little different uh, rats are always creatures so unless you're seeing me at 3 in the morning when they're seeing you at 3 in the afternoon they're passed out you wake them up when they're inside their little, little carrier and they get a little spooked and they like to bite here. Um, these guys are the same. Uh, they've got huge toes, you can pick them up by that, but they get really upset when you do that. So you can generally just scruff these guys and they're a lot bigger rats. Um, same deal there and we'll go over the injection sites soon. Ah, look at this thing, okay. so. We have essentially uh, a couple different uh, uh, injection sites, but, but the two most realistic, uh, intramuscular, and so you're going to use the femoris muscle. And then the second one here is, Danny, do you know what that would be? Looks like it's right in the, the, the thigh, isn't it? It's not. Nope. Wendy? <coughs> Very good, IP or intraperitoneal. P, peritoneal, the peritoneal cavity, the area that surrounds all of the abdominal organs. So we can actually hold them upside down. Why would I want to hold them upside down if I'm giving them an injection? Okay, that's one, but what's the real reason? What do you think that needle is? Organs fall down, you got it, baby. So I want the organs as far away from my needle. Nothing is worse than nicking an intestine, nicking a spleen. Uh, I nicked a spleen last night during a GDV surgery. It was sitting right up there, you touch a spleen, all a spleen likes to do is spurt blood, like, like massively. So the whole surgery stops for a couple minutes until you fix that, that bleeder here. So you wanna improve the safety here. So you can hold your little mouse and he's wiggling all over the place and you can just stab him in the belly. And we give him such small volumes. This is one of those one cc syringes. Uh, you can get a very, very good absorption right across the membranes of the vis. Same deal with the rat, IP injection. When we do IP injections, uh, you kind of draw a line right up the midline of the body here, and then you draw a line right across the umbilicus, and you stay in the caudal half on either side. Uh, Kels, why would I want to stay on either half of the, these sides here from a surgical perspective? There's a structure I want to avoid. It's not the innominate bone. Ah, it was for you. Uh, nope, actually I want to hit the linea alba in most cases. Danny, structure I'm trying to avoid right there. Right down the middle, right here. I'm drinking coffee, I should be worried about that in like an hour. Ah, uh, no, bladder, urinary bladder sits right here. You never really know how big they are and uh, you, you don't want to inject into the bladder because then they're just going to urinate out their drugs. And then that's another injection site. Oh, what comesters, okay. Skittish, uh, freaky, they, they look crazy. Look at him, he's ready to bite. Uh, same deal, nocturnal creatures. Um, you always want to make sure you've got good restraint. Uh, so that's what a hamster looks like. Looks like. Uh, same deal, these guys are, you don't know what they're gonna do here. Um, and guinea pig, incredibly common these days here. Kids love guinea pigs. Uh, vets see guinea pigs more and more. Um, there's always gotta be somebody at a clinic who's the go-to exotics guy because we're seeing a, a larger preponderance of owners that are actually shelling out the bucks. Not big bucks, but maybe a hundred bucks for this, a laceration repair, uh, that they love their guinea pigs. So uh, these guys, they squeal a lot. They get agitated very quickly. Uh, you have to be very, very decisive when you're working with them. When you're holding a hamster, ah, oh, look at that, active. So uh, all the things that you can do there, uh, this is how we hold. They're pretty uh, on the order of a couple hundred grams. Rabbits. We have tons and tons of different rabbits here. The, outside of the scope of this class to talk about that there. But one thing that's very, very important about rabbits is they have a very, very unique anatomy with respect to their back. You never, ever, ever pick them up like you would a, a, a smaller uh, animal. You're going to first scoop by the base of the legs and then gently restrain across the back here. They have incredibly powerful uh, rear, limb, uh, rear limbs. They kick violently. They kick so violently they can fracture their own spine here. So you're going to make sure that you hold them gently and then you never, ever, ever pull them up by their ears. That's an old wives' tale. Those magicians should be shot. Uh, the ears cannot support any weight whatsoever. So support across the back, support across the legs. You always have about two hands on them. And working with rabbits is really a two-person job in my opinion. I really like these guys. Um, and then we'll talk about injection site. But you see that? Never, ever their ears. Uh, this is a terrible thing to do. I don't know why that was ever out there. Um, rabbit restraint commonly employs either a, a rat, kind of like what we do with our cats. You got a burrito, or um, step one, you could scruff or support the back, but the thing is that that's gonna pick up by the feet and then kind of transport them to and fro. These guys are cool until they get pissed. And then when they start to get really hyper excitable, we typically stop, walk away, let the rabbit calm down here. We'll talk about how wonky anesthesia can be. Um, the respiratory rates are gonna be elevated. Heart rates are gonna be through the roof. Um, when we talk about just generally small, pocket pet or, or uh, exotic diseases here. Typically these guys get <coughs> a lot of upper respiratory issues. That's one thing that I typically see my colleagues working up. So <coughs> that's one thing you'll see 
And then in terms of that, either pr primary complaint's gonna be, I've seen a lot of discharge, I'm seeing a lot of coughing, sneezing, I'm seeing a lot of something in the URT or upper respiratory tract. Sorry. Um, this is another common area too. Uh, Danny, what's the perineum? Wendy? Yep, it's the area that actually surrounds the anus. The anus is just the anus, but the area around the anus is the perineum. So you're going to see a lot of diarrhea, soiling, discharge across there. Another reason, uh, when these little guys get dehydrated, they look like little skeletons. Their eyes get sunken in. They get very, very gaunt faces. You can see a lot of their preponderance of their facial bones too. Uh, dehydration is very, very prominent in these guys here. And whenever we can see the vertebra or pelvis, we can say that, wow, this guy is essentially very, very dehydrated, very, very sick. Um, these are the tests that we'll do across the board in our small animals. We'll of course put the caveat on blood tests with the really, really little guys. We'll have to walk away. <clears throat> Depending on the size of the bird as well, we can also do a couple tiny drops of blood looking for zinc tests, DNA tests to see what their sexes are, etc. Okay. Um, so with the pre-anesthetic care, like, um, cats, unlike dogs, and in small cases for short bit horses, we want to feed them up to anesthesia, and the moment they're recovered, we want their food in the cage, ready to go, got to eat, got to eat. If we don't keep good continuous flow, getting the peristalsis going here, and peristalsis once again is... Hurry, 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 we've got a lot of classes here, Danny. Yep, squeezing of the food through the gut here, that's peristaltic waves. If we don't have continuous activity there in the form of food, mechanically irritating the intestines to say, hey, squeeze through, we can get GI stasis. And that is a number one killer in our rabbit breeds. Their gut stops working, stops moving. Their gut becomes very, very active in the wrong direction. Gassy buildup, they stop eating, they go on a death spiral. That's the number one thing I used to kill my rabbits with. So you never withhold food, you never withhold water. Um, obviously, unless the stomach is involved with surgery. True or false, less the rabbit can vomit. False, the rabbit cannot vomit. Danny, what's the other species that cannot vomit? Horses. Perfect, so on a test that I might give you down the road, rabbit, or, uh, rabbits and horses cannot vomit. So you don't really worry about regurgitation, uh, so we wanna start feeding them as soon as possible. Okay, da-da-da-da-da-da, uh, da, 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 and we talked about all these. Excellent, cool, so pre-anesthesia. Sometimes you need to, usually you don't need to. These are very, very affected just by your induction agents here. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, they die. A lot of the workup, if you ever actually uh, you stand with your doctor, he's gonna stand there, she's gonna stand there and say, listen, Mr. or Mrs. Rabbit owner, guinea pig owner, gerbil owner, we can certainly do the anesthesia. The anesthetics that we use are typically safe, except in exotics. Uh, they, they can die. And I mean literally smooth death. There is no, oh look, the tsunami wave is coming. Let's plan for something here. We don't have those characteristic intraoperative complications like we do with the small animal guy. So either they survive or they die. And one of the guys I work with, he's been doing this for almost 20 years now. Uh, he says he hasn't lost a rabbit in 15 years. He's really lucky. Uh, back on the mainland, I have tons of colleagues that lose rabbits continuously here. So it's really luck of the draw. It has nothing to do with your technique. Obviously technique will help, but you can be the best straight A anesthetist ever and still lose these guys quite often. So part of the discussion always has to be, listen, these guys don't do well with the drugs that we have right now. We're still coming up with better protocols, but until then, just deal. Um, so we typically do chambers. Um, all right, atropine. Atropine is, hurry, hurry. I'm giving you seconds. Very good, wonderful. So atropine is an anticholinergic. These are effectively the reasons that we would use them in our uh, uh, exotic breeds. Except one, which we just talked about. If you guys did the reading, any, any idea which, which, which species we avoid anticholinergic use in? Well, uh, that's a very good answer, but this is the rabbit and rodent lecture. So we'll only talk about cats when we talk about that, which would eat the rabbit or the rodent, no? Well, we don't use them in rabbits. Any idea why, Wendy? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, along those lines. Along those lines. No, horse has a different reasons why, why we don't use the anticholinergics. No? Anybody? No? Ah. So now that I've given you the answer, anything that ever ends in the ASE uh, is an enzyme. So 50% uh, roughly of the major rabbits that we have in Western Europe and the United States have what we call atropine esterases. <coughs> Anybody have any idea what an atropine esterase does? What do you think this does to atropine? 
Right, breaks it down before you even get a chance to use it. So if you have a patient who makes their own atropine esterase, atropine will be null and void inside of their use here. Same with glycopyrrolate, by the way. So we can't really use, I mean, you can, you have a 50-50 chance, but we don't want to use that reliably. We don't want to tell our client, hey, there's a 50% chance that this pre-med might work. That's a terrible thing to do. So we typically avoid the use of anticholinergics and move forward from there. Um, so if we had issues with, let's say, um, well, let me stop for a second. Quick quiz. Danny, what would I give atropine for in an emergency setting in the middle of surgery? What's happening to my patient? Bradycardic. Bradycardic, wonderful. So Kelsey, if I can't use atropine, what's the drug of choice in a rabbit who is bradycardic? Which is going from a 200 to 190. <laughs> Die. Perfect, epinephrine, that's, that's a great drug to use. Uh, so that will speed up the heart right away. Excellent. Okay, so back to these, uh, we love opioids. Uh, we've talked about it. You, uh, you all answered the preemptive and multimodal analgesic questions 100%. I was, I was so proud, I was so, thank you. So I don't need to go over that. Uh, and then essentially you can give a sedative or a trink if they need to. And if you're gonna, it's typically the rabbit only because they're freaking out, man. Um, so we talked about anticholinergics. These are phenothiazines here. Uh, oddly enough, phenothiazine does not immobilize our rodent species. So it'll just give them a heavy sedation. We can keep jacking them up on, a, on a acepromazine and it's not gonna stop them. They're just gonna be really drunk until they're dead from the hypotension, okay. <clears throat> and benzodiazepines, we love them. Actually, these are the drugs of choice in our rabbit breeds here. They do very, very well with midazolam especially. Um, quickly now, uh, Les, what is one reason I would give midazolam instead of Valium to a rabbit uh, as a pre-anesthetic or intraoperative drug? Or post-operative, actually. Wrong. And so, Wendy, in terms of how we give these drugs, what would be different between midazolam and diazepam? The hint was how we give these drugs. Um, the always IV. Diazepam is always IV. The agent that the diazepam is carried in is very, very acidic, very, very toxic to the tissues. Midazolam, on the other hand, I can give intramuscularly. So I've got a rabbit freaking out. Would you want to try to get a catheter in this leg? Probably not, especially with the risk of an injury to the back or the neck here. So we can quickly give an IM injection and one of those big, juicy, frog-leg type muscles in the back, let them chill in a dark, quiet cage and like you're maybe hopefully a room that doesn't have cats or dogs in it, and you should be okay. Come back in about 20 minutes, they'll be up. Uh, Alpha-2 agonists work very, very well here. Uh, real quick, regarding this uh, concept right here. Alpha-2 agonists give you sedation and they give you analgesia. Clearly that's true because I wrote it up here. But then Kelsey, I give the reversal agent, right? And it doesn't matter which one, but what are the two types of reversal agents we have for alpha 2s? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, we have two types. So what are the two names of the two reversal drugs? We talked alpha about in just a few minutes. Drugs, uh, Crap. <laughs> I'm walking over to Danny. Adipamazole and Yohimbine are the two reversal agents here. So then true or false? If I were to give Adipamazole or Yohimbine, I clearly reverse the sedation, but do I also reverse the analgesia? Yes. yes. 100%. So when you're reversing the analgesia with your alpha-2 reversal agent, make sure you're also preempting uh, uh, any hyperalgesia with another narcotic, like an opioid, uh, an NSAID, that sort of thing here. And we do give NSAIDs to rabbits and rodents. Good. <coughs> uh, da, 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 da. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, we're going to move forward. Opioids, we love opioids. We keep talking about opioids. No need to go over that. You know all these things here. Okay, uh, so uh, like I said with rabbits, uh, I have a common route here. We actually try to avoid the sub-Q route in all of our exotic breeds here. And if possible, you always want to go IV. The only breed in terms of this luxury we can ever get IV catheterization in is our rabbits, period. Dot. Good luck trying to get in a dribble or a hamster. Um, <clears throat> and then essentially, think about giving an injection into the intraperitoneal area. I can't titrate it. And by that, what do I mean? I can't titrate an IP injection. Right, you either give all or none. So it's kind of like giving a chamber induction. We can't tweak it. You're just gonna get the whole bang and hopefully you don't die. So if there's a reaction, you can't uh, stop it here. And if you're too low or too high, you're kind of in a screwed up area. We don't like IP. There's also an irritating component to IP. Having that medication literally on the viscera, sitting on the intestines, on the spleen, on the liver, causes a little uh, tissue irritation. These structures were not designed for any exogenous fluids. So we wanna try to avoid IP if at all possible. We typically give IP routinely with sterile fluids for dehydrated patients. And if rarely had to, had to, we'll give an injection there. Okay, ketamine. 
topical. We talk about it all the time. It does provide a little bit of analgesia. It does provide a little bit of restraint. It is a drug that we would use. We like to use ketamine in combination with another series of compounds, though. In all species, ketamine by itself, rocky road. Uh, a lot of club kids like to abuse this drug here. They call it the special K or the K-hole or whatever. It, it's, it's not fun by itself here. But you add ketamine in a smaller dose with another one of our drugs here, you're actually going to get a very, very comfortable, very, very reliable uh, uh, tranquilization and anesthetic episode. Uh, and we talked about here this too. So and then your favorite, your favorite. We do use teletamine in our little guys. Teletamine is wildly expensive, but in the volume per dose here, we use a lot less. So we like to use uh, teletamine. It's fun. And once again, teletamine is going to be zolazepam um, uh, and telazole here. Um, and then we talked about neurolept analgesics before. Danny, what's one type of neurolept analgesic? That's a, that's a heavy hitter. Okay. I like where you're going with that though. You have an opioid and you have a tranquilizer. Yeah. So you put those two together, that is your neurolept analgesic here. We can go and do that as well here. Um, but we have to include a benzodiazepine in this case because that will in, in fact cause a little more sedation, a little more comfort in these patients here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then as usual, we can uh, reverse our opioids. We really like that effect here. And Wendy, what would be the drug of choice to reverse our fentanyl? Awesome. And then, Danny, is there a reversal agent for benzodiazepines? Uh, yes or no? From, from some flumazol. Close. Flumazonil. Flumazonil. That is the reversal agent of choice for our benzodiazepine. And then, Kelsey, let's say I give way too much acepromazine. What is the reversal agent there? A prayer. You got it. So hopefully they run. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, back in the day, before we had anything inventive, we used thiobarbiturates, thiopental, uh, all those drugs here. Uh, now we use them for euthanasia. So very, very narrow safety margin. Oh yeah, and I know some old school vets that say there's nothing wrong with euthasol. You can't, I, I, I scare my technicians all the time. And one day, maybe as I'm like a 99 year old vet on my last day, I will do one euthanasia induced anesthetic episode. You can. It's actually a very, very reliable anesthetic. Very smooth induction, very smooth onset. Uh, it's got very, very low tissue reaction. It's metabolized by the liver almost 100% uh, and then it effectively metabolizes very quickly. The only problem with thiopental or, uh, or euthanasia so solutions, sodiopentobarbital, very narrow safety range. As soon as you exceed the tiniest little amount, what happens? Death. So it's a very reliable euthanasia solution, a very unreliable anesthetic. We like instead propofol. We like things that give us a little wiggle room, uh, but you could theoretically, technically do it. I will never do that with you here, uh, obviously because of the reason why we use it. It stops the heart and stops breathing here. <coughs> And then propofol, um, it has to be administered IV, so we don't really get away with it in our gerbils and our hamsters, only rabbits if you had to. So for the most part, these guys are small rodents, get chamber induction, they get, uh, 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 well, the, you can also do the IP route here. Uh, once again, anesthesia is not very reliable in these little guys, so good luck to you if we're gonna do anything on them. And I, I've never known anybody who'll do like a fracture repair on a, on a gerbil, you know what I mean? Um, these things are just so god awfully expensive, et cetera. Uh, you can get cute, you can get real cute. This is a drug you will never ever see, but you might see it on the test. Alfaxalone is a drug. It's a steroid anesthetic that we will actually use for uh, induction in rabbits here. So it's actually a very, very wonderful drug, but it's typically relegated to research institutions. I've never personally seen it uh, ever. I've never ever seen the bottle, never seen the drug here, but it is used in the research setting. So you might see it. If so, this is a steroid anesthetic. I've yet to see one question about it, but it's come up in different literature surveys I've done when I was writing up these, uh, these lectures here. Uh, and it's been Mercer IV. Da, 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 da. Okay, so anesthetic chamber is probably going to be, for this talk, talk uh, rodents and exotics here, the most reliable because you can see what's going on here and you can do it consistently. When you do IP, well, what if it hits a fat ball? What, what if it doesn't absorb across the membranes? Uh, if you give IM in a small little guy, well, are you sure you gave the whole thing? Did they wiggle around, et cetera? Chamber reduction is actually probably the smoothest way to go here. Um, the drugs or the halogenated uh, volatiles that we would use are isofluorine, desfluorine, and sevofluorine. If you're going to use any one of these three and money was no option, uh, Les, which, which one of the three would you use, you think? Beautiful. Sevofluorine. Desfluorine is also pretty good there. Remember, desfluorine is that guy with single breath induction. <gasps> Done. So that would actually kind of be the safest. But sevofluorine is neck and neck. So I would take either. ISO is not actually as reliable. It can take a couple minutes here to get them under anesthesia. And it's in that process of going from awake to anesthetized, we might get some deleterious effects. So that's essentially what the setup would look like. Tube down here, tube up here. Which one of the two do you think would be the tubes actually delivering the gas? And which one do you think is the scavenge? So let me stop. Which one is a scavenge? A or B? 
You say B would be a scavenge? Everybody agree with that or disagree? Okay, why did you say that? Because uh, you need the gas to rise in the world. Very good. When you exhale that warm air, what is it going to do? Naturally tends to rise. And so if you have an active scavenging system there, this method in out would be the safest route here. If it was sucking in from here, there's actually most likely all your good gases down here. Nothing's going to happen down there. It's not going to be very uh, regular. So now what you'll see in most cases, though, are two side by side. And it's usually kind of middle of the middle of the, uh, the uh, PVC box here. There's one thing that they love to do. As soon as you start to scare them, I'm not going to breathe like a temper tantrum, a uh, rotten child here. You got to work with that too. Yeah, oh no. And as a result, if you're holding your breath, uh, what's the nerve that you might affect? Very good. When in doubt, vagus, Zach, vagus. And that actually might lead to a vasovagal reflex, a.k.a. a profound bradycardia. Uh, once again, one of the many reasons I don't like working with rabbits here. They don't like anything. And so if you come at them with the face mask, they might fight you. And so you might have two issues here. You might have cardiorespiratory depression. You also might have a rabbit jumping around, thrashing, hurting itself from an orthopedic or neuromuscular level. Very, 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 very scary. And then I never want to watch a rabbit in a chamber trying to escape here. They could kill themselves in the process. And little, little kids love their rabbits. And I'm not in the business of making little kids cry. It's a terrible, terrible thing to do. Yeah, exactly. So in these cases, if they're a risk at all. We're going to want to, yet again, for like the 10th time now, probably offer a pre-anesthetic, probably offer a tranquilizer, give them something to help them go through a smoother route here to anesthetize here. Um, rabbits have very, very sensitive trachea and uh, larynxes, so we're going to use a coal tip endotracheal tube. Do you guys remember what the coal endotracheal tube was? Teeny weeny little nothing guy, and it's essentially just one tiny PVC tube. Uh, it's a red rubber in some cases. It's got no cuff at the end. It's got a tiny hole as well. It's a very, very flexible tube. And in the rabbit, we'll talk about it, but it's a blind passage if you're going to tube them there. Oh, there it is. So the larynx is visualized if you're lucky. And I would say 70% of 80% of cases, you can't see it. And the process is pretty complicated. I will talk about it. Small rodents, small, small, small rodents. If you had the small enough tube, you can actually go nasopharyngeally, right into the uh, nostril, right into the pharynx. And that's essentially like we did with the equine model too. Um, that'll actually provide a fairly safe method of gas anesthesia here. <laughs> what nasal catheter would look like in these guys here. Um, click about rabbits then. You got a rabbit and then essentially you're trying to knock them out here. They've come in and they're relatively okay. The typical process in terms of a, a, a rabbit anesthetic procedure is uh, pre-medication and then essentially you have two teams. There's always like maybe like a backup team is maybe a little better here. And team one gets about anywhere from five to ten minutes to try to pass an endotracheal tube if they're in the business of uh, endotracheal intubation. Clearly, as, as you're kind of graduating through this class, you know you want to secure an ET tube in the event of all sorts of abnormalities. You'll try. It's a blind technique. And essentially, the technique is uh, you extend their head in a sternal recumbency and slowly try to pass this coal uh, endotracheal tube. Uh, they talk about the warm gas at the end. If you see condensation at the end of your tube, you know you're in. No coughing or no condensation, you're probably not in. After about 10 minutes, if you haven't done anything, then your next team uh, is going to try. And if they can't get it anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, you either have to figure out, abort this procedure and figure out what to do, or go to a face mask. That's typically the rabbit induction model here. Very, 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 very nervous here. And then we typically use out-of-circuit vaporizers. Why is that again, anybody? Out-of-circuits? You got it. And it's a lot more effective here, a lot more precision versus our in-circuit vaporizer. And what was the difference primarily between the in-circuit and out-of-circuit vaporizer systems? Let me switch that question around. The isofluorine, sevofluorine, desfluorine, enfluorine uh, uh, devices that we use, the cool ones, the expensive ones, the fancy ones, are those in-circuit or out-of-circuit? No. Why are they out-of-circuit? These devices are so sensitive, they actually uh, create a lot of resistance to airflow. So the in-circuit systems are those old school ones that I showed you that I had to look up in a museum's website because even I've never seen them. The, the Ohio 8, the, the, the old school tech anesthesia. So the out-of-circuits are the ones that we're typically uh, used to here. I just want you to get very comfortable with out-of-circuit or in-circuit concepts here. You'll see a whole different bunch of ways in, in terms of how you buy these devices or uh, work with these devices or repair these devices. You need to see all the lingo here. Okay, so uh, typically too, we use an open 
non-rebreathing system. I know in your heads, you've already done all that, cool. <clears throat> and then in terms of the depth of anesthesia, we're gonna do tail pinch or pedal withdrawal with our small little guys here. And rabbits and guinea pigs, the ear is as sensitive as the horse as an indicator for anesthetic depth. We typically do not use the eyes in terms of uh, reliability there. Uh, it's really a cat and dog thing. Kelsey, with respect to the horse, what is reliable about the eyes? What is that gonna tell me? Well, we said eyes typically do a little nystagmus, and what would the nystagmus reflect with the horse? But what does that reflect? Not what is nystagmus, but what does the nystagmus tell me? Okay, well, what depth of anesthesia am I in if my horse is going under? They're either going down or they're becoming too light. So we constantly look at the eyes from the, so the anesthetist's business end is obviously the head end on an equine. All those tubes and, and wires that you saw, their assistant's gonna help them through the surgery. But the uh, anesthetist is constantly gonna be looking at the eyes because that's a pretty reliable way to say, am I staying under or am I coming out of it or am I getting into it here? Uh, and so this is a typical anesthetic delivery system. And look how cute this little endotracheal tube is. We're ta and, and so this is essentially just a simple, simple uh, anesthetic circuit. This is a modified McGill over here. And this is that coal that I was telling you about. And this is a blind intubation here. This is a little rabbit here. Vices that we're talking about. These are the coals. They don't have a cuff at the end. They don't have the little uh, 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 puffer at the end for inflating the cuff here. And then essentially a very, 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 very small lumen here. And this is a modified um, McGill, but this is the circuit that we're all very used to. Same that I would kind of use in my kitten or my puppy. Well, cool, it's what I would use in my rabbit. So pre-medication, if I'm gonna start from scratch, I'm gonna give them an IM injection, 30 minutes. I'm gonna put them in a cage. I'm gonna have a rabbit only area if I'm going to do rabbits in my opinion, and I'm gonna leave some hay up in there. And then just before I start, I'm gonna pull it out and take out the water too. Okay, these would be, if I was to do it, my route. Hydro, midazolam, a little glyco. Place catheter. And so what part of the rabbit is this, anybody? It's kind of a tough picture to, to very good. So you can get away with the ear. Somebody give me a second sight if maybe uh, uh, my rabbit came to me after a nasty dog fight. No ears. Where else would I go? No, oh, right in the cephalic. Uh, so uh, I know, terrible picture. Sorry, it's the best that I could do. Uh, this is the cephalic of our little rabbit. So we have kind of two cool options here. Uh, okay. We're going to try Ket Midazolam. I'm a big fan of midazolam these days, or propofol, but we're currently on a global propofol shortage, so we're also on a global Valium shortage right now, too. Uh, life is tough in the veterinary world, guys. We get no love. And then these guys love to laryngospasm. So just like a what breed would I like to use lidocaine? Very good. Lidocaine and rabbits, you're going to add just a drop or two of lidocaine to anesthetize or desensitize the glottis here. If you get laryngospasm, you're going to hurt their larynxes or their trachea. Part of that 30 minutes I was talking about, if, if the anesthetist is just kind of jabbing into the, the larynx and, the, and it's just not giving up, they're going to walk away. They're going to say enough is enough here. You you don't want to compromise the, the larynx here. We talk about constantly the ABCs of CPR, airway, airway, airway. You swell that airway, you tear that airway, you screw up that airway in such a way, the patient's going to die. And so we obviously want to do more good than harm in this job. So once again, if uh, in 30 minutes we don't get anything, either abort or face mask this guy here. You can't, you can't cowboy through this here. Uh, in terms of cats and rabbits, I'm very, very, very uh, 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 respectful of their oropharynx. Okay, heart rate and rhythm, uh, essentially the same as uh, any other species here. Small rodents, same as our little cats here. Uh, CRT, we're essentially we're only going to use our CRT and our rabbits only because our gerbils, hamsters, etc. Really, really small mouth, typically dark mucosa, and not a very reliable indicator for CRT. Uh, blood loss, as you can imagine, is a very, very big deal, but we don't have any wiggle room. So uh, you also have to tell yourself, what is my procedure, and do I have the ability to do this as uh, uh, atraumatically as possible? You don't want to injure them here. In terms of monitoring blood pressure, uh, arterial blood pressure, outside of now the rabbit, what is the other species we talked about we could do an arterial blood pressure in? Horses. They have big, big, you see typically the facial artery or the lingual facial uh, artery. Those are the ones that we're going to use to kind of evaluate arterial blood pressure. Uh, because it's a rabbit, we can also do the ear artery or their, their tail. Their tail is actually a really, really fun place. ECGs are not suitable. ECGs, not at all in our small guys because their hearts are so faint, their uh, body doesn't transmit the electricity as well, and their heart rates are so astronomically high, uh, they don't typically make devices anyway for them. So across the board, um, ECGs are not a reliable intraoperative measure to figure out where is my patient more uh, 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 interesting here. So this is the cuff over on the forearm, and what's this up here, Kelsey? 
beautiful and I love how we can use Paul socks. Can you see on the other side how juicy that vein is? I mean, it's like working on a pig. They're pretty cool. Okay. Respiratory rate and depth. We don't use a reservoir bag in these guys here, so we're gonna have to actually use their, uh, their chest here. Um, heart rates can be th uh, through the roof. This is very important. Um, it doesn't matter what their heart rate is, it's gonna be very, very high, but as the anesthetist, if you're gonna be doing these, you just need to be aware of trends. As I keep telling you about trends, what direction are we going in, up, down, or lower? And if you suddenly see a 50% drop over time, that does tell you that something's gonna happen if you're gonna see it. Uh, typically, right after this is beep, so asystole, yeah, and then CPR time. Uh, pulse ox, yeah, baby. We're gonna need machines that are very, very sensitive. Right, so uh, our machines typically cap out right around 200, 240, depending on uh, which system you use. They're pretty useless for our exotics here. Uh, so we have, we can kinda, to work on there. Okay, thermal rate, kinda, why did you do it backwards? Okay, sorry guys. Um, anybody know the difference between side stream or mainstream capping gram? I know Ross does because he buys them all the time. <laughs> so the machines that we use that uh, are, uh, are ETCO2, do you think those are mainstream or side stream devices? Those are mainstream devices. The device is right in there. Side stream is there's a little probe that'll measure CO2 output, but it's actually attached to a computer elsewhere. So that's all they're talking about with mainstream versus side stream. Think about how much a rabbit weighs. Think about how large a rabbit is relative to a chihuahua. Rabbits have very, very high surface area to body weight ratios. As a result, drug dosing can be a little on the complicated side. Thermal regulation can also be on the complicated side. These guys can get hypothermic very, very quick. They can cool very, very quickly here. So we're very, very cautious about their temperatures because that will kill you uh, intraoperatively here. So we try to be as minimal as possible when we're shaving. Uh, uh, prepping, you want to use minimal amounts of alcohol, you want to try to have as much heat support as you can, and as quick a procedure as possible. The longer the procedure, the more likely these guys aren't going to uh, 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 do well here. And, um, well, these are all things that you know, uh, it's the same. Uh, so this is a mainstream capnogram, side stream capnogram. Mainstream, this is the actually attaches, the sensor is built in right here, it'll transmit the data to the computer. The sensor is actually inside, but it transmits the information to the computer, then the computer processes the information. Just little things you might need to know. Um, for our guys, we want a recovery area that's pretty warm, stays warm. Uh, we want warm bedding. We want food available. We want water available. We want the water to be in a familiar container because these guys go on hunger strikes. So we want to create as comfortable a spa-like setting as possible as they're coming out of things. We also want them home as soon as possible. You don't want to leave them in the hospital all day while the owners are coming back. So you really try to work with these guys weekends, etc. And in a pinch, if you had to, sub or intraperitoneal warm fluids as well to get them warmed up here. And of course, you want to make sure that they're not painful. Depression can be a major issue as well in all species here. So if you've got them intubated, give them some supplemental oxygen. If you can't, get them in an O2 chamber ASAP. Let them kind of get uh, comfortable here. Extend their he head and neck if at all possible. And by compressing their chest, you can actually stimulate respirations, especially in our rabbits. Uh, with our small rodents, we can actually, see what this is? Yeah, it's a syringe, and you can jerry-rig your uh, endotracheal, not endotracheal, you can jerry-rig your uh, left arm, right arm coming out of your uh, anesthesia machine, obviously your ISO is turned off or whatever, and you just turn on the gas, kind of put a little tape around there, and ta-da, they're breathing. They're breathing great. So you can jerry-rig whatever you want. Face masks are typically too big for these guys. You can, I mean, you fit the whole you know, darn patient in there. So you gotta figure out how we can just kind of get this in involved. So cute little picture. Circulatory failure can be an issue as well. So once again, we can do fluid therapy, IV if possible, if not sub-Q, and if not IP. Transfusions are typically done, just like in any cases. We have plasma volume expanders. Does anybody know one kind of plasma volume expander? Head of starch. You guys have maybe heard of that, no? Or oxyglobin, yeah? Or hypertonic saline. Those are the three most common plasma volume expanders that we have here. Ha, cardiac arrest. Let me just stop for a second. They did a study not too long ago about cardiac arrest. You ever watch uh, Chicago Hope, ER, all those cool shows here? Yeah, they actually did, uh, it was, or ER was on TV for like 15, 16 years. So they did a study based on all the years that uh, ER was on TV, and they actually found all the patients on the show who went into cardiac arrest. Do you know what the revival rates were for the people that went into from the shows? Close to 90%, high 80s, low 90s, right? That was on the show. Well, they actually went to the original uh, hospitals that they modeled these things off of, and in the same time period, they looked into their records, and do you know what the real recovery times were? Less than 30%, so that's the real world, right? So my clients come in and they think, oh, emergency doctor, you can save my animal. I watch it on TV, ha ha. Do you know what the survival rates with small animal models are with CPR? Single digits, 
So if your animal goes into circulatory failure and their heart just stops, well, they don't have a heart failure because they eat McDonald's or they're you know, uh, drug users, et cetera, or smokers. They go into heart failure because they've got a diseased organ and it's shutting down. So uh, just something you need to kind of mention with your guys here. Just thought that was interesting. So I laugh whenever I see anything related to CPCR uh, with respect to small animals because it's, it's not that effective. I, I hate to be a negative nail. Of course we'll try it. In a given year, I'll survive five, Ten of my thousand uh, uh, deaths that, that happen on our, on our watch here, uh, we accept mortality in these situations. But if you're going to, you're going to try external cardiac massage. Once again, what's the heart rate? High two, three hundred. It's good luck, right, Ross? You're like a telegraph typist on math, man. It's impossible. Uh, so when we're doing our CPR lab, do you know how fast you guys are going to be doing your chest compressions? Yeah, about 100 to 150 times a minute. I can do it forever in my clinic. It's just what I do all the time. But I, I love watching my other doctors try it. They're sweating. They're hyperventilating. We have to go in rotations with these guys here. And you're going to have to as well because most people, you just, you just can't do it that often that faster, you know? Um, so <laughs> this is funny. Uh, and of course, you've got your emergency drugs. Give me one emergency drug. Yep, give me another emergency drug. Perfect. You've got it all here. Uh, so pain assessments are kind of difficult too with our nocturnal creatures because their instinctive response uh, is, is one of two things. I'm either going to get really skittish and wig out and jump all over the place and bite you or pretend like I'm dead. Right, so if you're an animal and you've pretended like you're dead and you're hurting badly, as the technician or doctor, good luck trying to evaluate uh, what their pain status is. They are completely shut down. Uh, this is part of their natural adaptive mechanisms. Uh, so essentially for the undisturbed animals, you want to look at their body, just open up the little box that the little kid brought them in, etc. just see what they're doing, look at their hair coat. Uh, anybody know what pilo erection is? Yes, the hairs on your neck have stood up. So pilo erection, pilo, the root follicles erection, obviously to stand up on end. If that's up, then you can kind of get an idea. This guy's hurt or painful here. And then rats get this funky, funky discharge when they're stressed or sick, right? That's well, one of the reasons that they'll come to you. So this isn't an indicative of anything, but it gets the ball rolling. Oh, I think you've got a chronically ill patient here. And then uh, cats and uh, rodents, essentially when they're sitting in the back of the cage, arms kind of curled up underneath them, they're not doing much anything. To me, that, that's a flashing sign. I'm sick, I'm hurt, I'm painful, something, something's going on. I like my patients to kind of stroll through the cage, rub their backs along the grates, you know, act like you're okay with everything. But you're sitting in a corner on a, on a death spiral, I'm really concerned, I'm gonna start getting involved there. And then, with these disturbed animals, try to get them mo uh, move around here, see what they're gonna do. Um, are they sort of uh, lethargic and listless, or are they aggressive when you're trying to go near them? Either or it could signal that there's something going on here. Um, if they're vocalizing or not vocalizing or biting you, you're just gonna have to roll with it but if they're doing something very very irregular kind of gives you the idea that there might be something wrong there uh, immobility would be this guy's just kind of you know done his little uh, fear uh, 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 predator uh, prey response thing here and then uh, try to have the owners monitor food and water intake pre-measure everything and see really are these guys not eating or drinking because a lot of our exotic guys just kind of feed and walk away free feeders or ad libitum we don't like that so we're going to get more specific uh, we've talked about it here analgesics we typically like opioids i like to combine my opioids with an NSAID all species by the way but if i'm going to give an NSAID i'm going to be thinking about what guys right across the bat do i want to just willy-nilly give an NSAID to anybody right away no what do i want to do right off the bat Opioids I give with reckless abandon. I don't care if you're sick, stressed, old or young. They're very, very tolerable, but liver. Or what's another organ I'm worried about? Nope, kidney. I get concerned with stomach as a side effect, but I like to know what they're walking into. So I typically force my owners to get a quakey blood test with me. You don't want to do that? I'm not going to give you an NSAID. Ask me how many NSAID toxicities I get. Virtually none. You want to know what you're walking in. So debilitated, very young, very old, sick, dehydrated or pre-existing hepato or renal toxicities, no NSAIDs, just opioids. But you've got a healthy patient, cool, rock them together, you're going to see some amazing benefits here. Because one element you can't get with an opioid is that non-steroidal portion, the anti-inflammatory portion, that's really great at the local level. Uh, opioids are really good at what portion of the pain pathway, guys? Perfect, modulation and perception. My NSAIDs are really good at what, what area, guys? Transmission, excellent. And also, perfect transduction by decreasing the inflammation. Oh, it's all coming together, great. You're gonna do very well on your drugs here. And then these are a lot of different kinds. You did pretty well on your non-steroidals too when you're giving those lists here. Okay, so locals, we talked about locals, why we wanna use them, they're fantastic.
fantastic. I'm a big fan here. Uh, with chronic pain too, we're going to give NSAIDs and sometimes opioids. But if we're going to do that, monitor long-term use. How are we going to monitor, guys? Periodic blood work physical exams. You never just give them like a two-year supply and walk away. You want to see these patients more frequently. All right. So once again, we talked about IV administration, difficult. We've talked about IM administration. We've talked about the sub-Q. Oral is tough because these guys don't like you and they got sharp teeth. I'm talking dangerously sharp teeth. So good luck with that as well. <laughs> uh, when we talk about the post-operative rule, I can't stress this enough. You want them to wake up in a room not surrounded by their prey. What do we talk about with stress? It immobilizes you. It decreases wound healing. It increases your length of mortality. It increases your morbidity. It uh, immunosuppresses. Nothing good about stress in all forms. So for them to wake up, imagine you're a mouse and above you are three cats just staring at you like dinner. You're gonna get sicker and probably have an issue here. Preemptive analgesia, I don't need to talk about it because you guys are awesome. And then if we give a pre-medication and we end up using less inhalant anesthesia, what is that a concept of anyone? Danny, since you started mumbling. <laughs> multimodal anesthesia. If I use multimodal or balanced anesthesia, I get to use less of more drugs and get all of their benefits with virtually none of their toxicities. How awesome is this? Okay, so preemptives, cool. Opioids, cool. And, and said, uh, we've talked about that. Awesome.